Our scripture reading for today comes from 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 15. The heading in many of our versions is Generosity Encouraged, beginning here at verse 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Sure. I like to keep things mixed up. You know. I can look at this side now. Lyle's having this side left. We're getting all kinds of crazy up here. So, uh, <laughs> this is our third sermon in a series on uh, stewardship, gifts. Uh, this is the second sermon on a series within the series on giving. Uh, now, one of the things that I feel like I need to sort of confess or put out there, it is something I've been working through in my mind, is that Hesses notoriously, at least my uh, brand of Hesses, uh, notoriously do not talk about money. Art and Fred did not talk about money. So talking about money makes me just a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit nervous. We did not like people telling us what to do with money. As a matter of fact, I think one time I tried to get my dad, who owned his own business, uh, to support a basketball team that I was playing on, and you would have thought that I was asking him to start an NBA franchise. <laughs> so, uh, two things. One of, them, uh, one of the things is I've brought Lyle up here with me to sort of help me. We sort of have conversation about money, and then I feel like it's a little bit less in your face. The other thing was, though, I was, as I was driving to church this morning, like there was this little part of me that could almost hear God saying to me, Hunter... What we are talking about is not something that should feel funny. It shouldn't feel awkward. As a matter of fact, what we're talking about is super important because we're talking about the ways that I, God, bless you and the ways that I, God, am inviting you to participate in, in relationship with me. And, and as a matter of fact, the giving is a gift. Um, I guess one of the things that I was thinking was I've never in my entire experience of 14 years of being a pastor, had anyone say to me, Hunter, I gave so much that my life was completely ruined. But I have had many people say to me, Hunter, when I started taking giving seriously, my life was changed forever. So that gives you a little bit of a backdrop into where we're at and how we got here and the ways that we're thinking. So one of the thoughts that I had was sort of just thinking about how, you know, we were received last week. Of course, again, in the moment, I'd not gotten this word from God about the inspiration of giving. And so when I walked through the line and people shook my hand and didn't look me in the eye and just kind of said, have a nice day, I assumed, because I'm a human being, <laughs> that they hated the sermon. <laughs> but thankfully, thankfully, I know that's probably not the case. And thankfully, there were quite a few people that came through the line and said, Hunter, this is really important stuff. 
And so we did get a little critique, and you, you got yeah. a little critique from last week. Yes, yeah, so somewhere along the line in, uh, during the sermon last week, it was mentioned that tithing is a suggestion. And, um, and so one of the, one of the, so an individual came to me and said, hey, I, I don't think tithing is a suggestion. It seems pretty clear to me that Scripture says that tithing is a command or a requirement. So we've talked a little bit about that. So what, what are your thoughts about that since, uh, since last week? Since I'm the one that said tithing is, tithing is a suggestion? <laughs> <laughs> and Jack Hess, the head of finance, was like, what? No, he was not the one. Sorry, Jack. Um, so I guess one, one of the things, I think that sometimes our language fails us. And oftentimes as a pastor, you know, we struggle with certain things. And, and part of that being for me is realizing that many of us probably don't live up to a 10% tithe going to the church. You know, I didn't want to make people feel guilty. And I don't want us to feel guilty. But we want to recognize or play with the idea that um, sort of this 10% tithe is is part of the law. It's part of a biblical mandate. And what's the purpose of that? And we talked about Jesus saying, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. And so in that statement, I feel like there is a tension that's created. We have law and we have God's grace. Which is more important? Well, obviously God's grace is more important because Jesus recognized that we could never live up to the law. When it says that Jesus fulfilled the law, I think what we understand from that is that Jesus' death on the cross, the forgiveness of our sins, grace, was there to connect us to God. So in essence, I think we can kind of draw the conclusion that the law, the rules that God gives us, is things about being holy, about being righteous, that song that we just sung, I think fits so perfectly with that idea that the law was about being righteous, being holy, so that we could be connected to God. So the law all at one time is really important, and it's a part of our relationship and our faith with God, and tithing would be part of that. Jesus admitted that much. But there's also grace, because Jesus understood that as human beings, very rarely we live up to that law. So you had sort of a way of an analogy I like. Yeah, we, we were talking about this, and it made me think of just the whole, um, like thinking about it, the, the analogy of our health. So just to give you an example, if I started eating 5,000 calories a day, and I only was burning off 2,000 2000 calories a day, and did that over a period of weeks and months, the truth of the matter would be that I'd start to gain weight. And um, at some point, doing this on a regular basis, it would create a lifestyle that could be detrimental to my health. It could give me a higher rate of, you know, heart disease and diabetes and cancer, and so that, that lifestyle would, could lead to less than a fulfilled life. Um, I just can't live the way I would like to because my health is, could be um, failing me and, and hurting me. And I, I think there's a, a, a connection here. Um, certainly, eating like that, I'm not going to die the next day when I start eating like that, but a lifestyle like that could lead to some detriments, and I think the same way comes in our finances. If we're not, if we're not giving and being generous, it's, it's not like we're going to hell, but we're not getting the fullness of, of life. Oh, yeah, because of God's grace. So it's a nice analogy, and say there's physical, there's certain physical laws that we understand that this is how the world works, um, but because of God's grace, we still have that connectivity to Christ, but that doesn't mean that we want to throw these things away. Correct. So... I I, I like that. I like that analogy. That works for me. Um, So in a way, we start to think about this entire series, or at least I've been thinking about this entire series, is about right relationship with God. Using the gifts that God has given to us, being good stewards of the gifts that God has given to us, empowers us to have a deeper, more connected relationship with God. Okay, so another one of the little critiques that I got on Friday... Uh, it sounds, you know, this is funny. I was worried we were going to challenge you too much. On Friday, I was having breakfast with a, someone from our congregation, and, I, you know, I have no idea how much money this person has, but I have a sneaky suspicion that they have, a, you know, a good bit, and it was relatively well-to-do. And what this person said to, to me was, Hunter, you did not challenge our congregation enough. He said, as a matter of fact, to me, a particularly wealthy person, he said, imagine making a million dollars. I can hardly imagine making a million dollars, but... If you imagine you made a million dollars and you gave 100000 you still have $900,000. Who needs $900,000? In essence, I think it was sort of a reminder of each and every one of us is in a different place. 
And as we come to God and we come in prayer and we ask Christ, Jesus, what would you want us to do? What do we need? How much is enough? And we wrestle with and reflect on these things. I mean, in that case, the 10% tithe sort of becomes a suggestion again for the person that has more, um, saying that there's no reason that you can't give more. That, what did you say? That the 10% tithe is not… Um, it, uh, how, did, how did you say that? It's, it's not going to be… It's, it's not like a rule that gets us in or out of heaven. Correct. In that way, it's, it's a base, it's a beginning, it's a guideline. Yep. Um, there was one other thing, though. I can't remember what it was. That's why you're up here, too. Go, no? Go to Scripture. Or? Okay. That sounds good. <laughs> I know there was one more thing, but I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Maybe we'll the, get to all, it The later. way the Holy Spirit works with me is I become forgetful at times when the Holy Spirit's like, hey, you don't need to say that. Okay. So, we do want to look at the Scripture a little bit today. Uh, so, I'm going to… Lyle, would you mind yep. reading for so us? We're going to start right where, uh, where Galen was reading the, the first part of there, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 9. I'm going to read 9, uh, 6, and 7. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Okay, verse 6. To me, verse 6 is what, it, it's what this whole series is all about. When we give willingly of our time, when we give of our bodies, when we give of our gifts, when we give of our finances, we will so generously, we will get so much from God. And I keep feeling like I need to say it for those that haven't been here. Lyle and I are not professing some sort of uh, system where if you give a certain amount of money, you'll receive that money back. But we do believe the Bible's very clear that when we give, when we give of our time, when we give our finances, when we give of our gifts, we will receive back blessings from God, joy, hope, and peace. And, I, man, I just, I love that. I love verse 6. I think that connects back to uh, the, the whole idea of health. If, if we're eating well, if we are exercising and taking good care of our bodies, we have so much more to give, more energy, more just life that we can have, and I think that, that connects to that idea of blessing. Physical life and spiritual life. Correct. And this, yeah, this, so it's all, it's all about part of the spiritual journey. I love it. So verse 7, though, I think is kind of where we're focused today a little bit, and we're going to get into some nuts and bolts about giving, but first I want to just look at this. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. So this idea of in your heart takes me back to last week's, our, our challenge to you to pray, to be in prayer, thinking about what God might be asking you to give. What has God placed upon your heart? What is the Holy Spirit saying to your heart? Just the word decided there made us both think about giving with an intentionality. Uh, somewhere along the way, Jesus says, you know, we don't want to be blown by the winds back and forth by like, like a palm tree that waves back and forth. We want to have a plan. We want to have intentionality on how we're giving and what we're doing. Um, we don't want to just, you know, give in a moment because of something wonderful that we've seen and then maybe we don't have enough to give it another time. We want to develop a plan. So, uh, intentionality, Lyle's going to talk about that in a little bit. It also says not to give reluctantly. And it says to give cheerfully. I think the reluctantly and the cheerfully are sort of inversely related and I think comes down to the same thing. I think we will not give, we will never give with reluctance or we will always give cheerfully, depends on if you want to look at it from the negative or the positive, if three things are right in our lives. If, first of all, we are giving God thanks. If, first of all, we can look at our lives and we can look around at all that we have, and I look around this room and I see a whole bunch of people that have a lot, and I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about people, about things in their lives that have value. We are a blessed people. And more we understand our blessing, the easier it is to give. I think another aspect, and it kind of goes along with that, is do we trust God to take care of us? In Genesis, when Jesus, when God, Jesus, when God talks to Abram, God says to Abram, I will bless you, and you will be a blessing. I will bless you. Do we trust God that we will have enough? Do we trust God that we will have the things that we need? When we trust God that we will have enough and we'll have the things that we need, it's much easier to give because we know that we don't need what we're giving. 
Another aspect, and the, the, the last aspect of, of that giving is trusting that God will build the kingdom with that money. Do we trust that God will build the kingdom with the money that we give? You know, I think sometimes people hold back from giving to a church because they just don't like the direction that a church is going. Can we trust that sometimes God is going to build the kingdom in ways that we don't expect? Or maybe it's our job to change the church that we're in so that our church has the right focus and is moving the directions that we want it to. Our giving will be cheerful when we're thankful, when we trust God with our lives, and we trust God with where that that money is going. So I promised you that we would spend a little time focused on what it means to be an intentional giver. I'm going to turn it over to Lyle in the midst of that. Yeah, I told um, a story last week about giving in my life, just what I've observed from my parents. And um, I think a, a, a strong tradition within uh, my growing up, and I think within this church, was, is the envelope system. We're going to talk a little bit, some of the nuts and bolts here about, about giving and thinking about that. Um, so I, for years, have used the envelope system. If you're not familiar, you can get envelopes at the beginning of the year. You can put your check or cash in the envelope, and then it keeps track of your, your giving throughout the year. And I was uh, very reluctant to stop doing that, even though there were some pulls from church encouragement, hey, like electronic giving's easier, and it creates consistent cash flow for the church. But there was something about the participation element that I was uh, afraid to give up. And, um, and this is where each person needs to come down and say, okay, what, what system works best for you? Uh, eventually, the convenience of the, the bill pay and the electronic system eventually won over, and that's, that's the current system that, that I use, uh, that, that Janae and I use. Um, so the way I have it set up is I have a bill pay that's um, corresponding with my direct deposit from my, my check. So the day after my check comes in the, my account, there's a corresponding bill pay that, that comes out to the church. And that, for me, connects with the, some of the first fruits teaching. We haven't talked much about that, but the idea that the first is coming to God. And, um, and so then, you know, w- when I get a raise, then I uh, just go in and, and adjust that up to whatever the amount is. And, and one of the questions that, that also came out of last week's sun sermon, and I often get is, well, is this, should, this be, should the tithe be off the gross or off the net? And for me, I feel it's pretty clear. I think it should be off the gross um, for a number of reasons. One is if you look back to the scriptures that we looked at last week, it was teaching the Israelites to bring uh, 10% of all their, all they produced. It didn't say anything about a net of anything. And so I, I thought, I think from scripture it's pretty clear. And also if you look just in practicality, our taxes don't come off anything. I mean, the taxes come off the gross. If you contribute to a 401k, that comes off the gross um, I, I feel personally convicted that my tithes should also, so also come off the gross. I still like to put the envelope in the basket. I, there's something for me about putting it in there and something even for me about uh, my children watching that happen to see that this is what we do as followers of Jesus. Though I will tell you the weeks that we go on vacation, the week after that when I'm writing the double check always sort of hurts just a little bit. That human <laughs> nature inside of me, the human nature inside of me does not love writing the double. Again, we're not here to tell you exactly how to do it. I, the point behind us is be intentional. Have a plan. Have a system that works for you to do this on a regular basis. Um, a couple other things that I've observed that I thought I'd share with you. The, these are just um, ideas that I've gathered along the way from, from work and some other things um, that I'll just share this morning. One was that I had a family who had committed to increase their percentage of giving by 1% per year. I think they had a cap that they were, gonna, they were trying to get to 25% of their total income was going to go to charity. So just, again, I don't know where this hits you, but if you're looking at ways of challenging yourselves, um, that might be something that you want to apply. So every year they would intentionally look, okay, what have we given? What's our income? And then try to um, move that up 1%. Uh, another story I heard, um, this was a, somebody who was in their mid-20s, uh, were just starting into business, and they committed that they were, only, they were going to cap um, their lifestyle. They were only going to live off a, a certain amount of money. I think there was a system that they had... Um, to increase that with like the standard of living uh, increases like 3% or something. But anything that their business or other sources of income generated, that was all going to be given away. 
And the amazing part, they're telling a story now two or three decades after making that commitment and the business has just amazingly flourished and they are giving like, like literally hundreds of thousands of dollars away from the profits. Um, it might actually be in the millions uh, from the profits of their, of their business. So again, just things to think about of ways of, of challenging yourself to, to give more and be intentional. So, Lyle, when I hear you talking about those things, I, again, almost it gives me little heart palpitations. But, you know, and I ask myself, why? Why does that sound so challenging or why does that sound so hard? And I think one of the things that we, I have to remember is and why it might be more impor important to talk about this more than once every four years. Um, the world that we live in is telling us over and over again. Every moment of every day, you open a magazine, you turn on your television, you look at what your next door neighbor has, um, and the world is telling us over and over and over again that the true path to happiness is spending. The true path to happiness is owning the car that you've always wanted, or the true path to happiness is uh, that house that's just a thousand square foot bigger than the ones you own now. Or there's just always this idea that the true path to happiness is to spend. It's not true. It's not true. I mean, and there's study after study after study, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next week, I think. Uh, there's studies that show us that giving leads to happiness. And the people that give the most tend to be the happiest people. And it's so counter to the way we think. It's so incredibly challenging, and it's so hard. Again, do we trust, do we trust God? So, Lyle, another one of the things that I was thinking about, and, and did mention this last week, and as a, a pastoral care provider for the church, um, you know, one of the situations that really does, I mean, it, 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 I don't know, it just creates a lot of compassion within me is I will go to retirement communities and I will spend time with um, some of our wonderful senior citizens who are people that have supported this church. It literally probably built this church. I mean, literally built this space that we're living in, we're preaching in. This holy space, this building where people come and where kids come and learn and grow and, and we're challenged in our faith. People who built this church who are now on fixed incomes and now struggling with what does it mean that I can't give kind of the way that I used to. Again, I talked about it. It's one of the things I love about the 10% tithe. When we're making less, we can give less. Um, but I think there's something that just sort of hurts our soul yeah. sometimes when we're used to working and giving a certain amount and suddenly we can't give as much. And it, it almost feels like we're not pulling our weight. And I just want to say to you that that's not the case, that we are all in this together. We all have our place. And, you know, our, the calling comes out of that. But you did have some ideas. Yeah, there's one, one strategy that specifically, again, we're getting into the nuts and bolts here a little bit, but one strategy for seniors that I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of. Um, I, I think most of you are aware that if you are 70 and a half and you have an IRA, that you need to take a, a regular distribution or the IRS will be after you. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a rule put in place or a, a, a little bit of a change that allowed you to let that, uh, instead of you taking it in, in a distribution to yourself, you could give that distribution directly to a charity, to a church or, or a charity of your choice. And the strategy, especially with the tax law change that just happened here in 2018, a, a year ago, um, really made that for most seniors, you're going to get some tax benefits for having that go directly to charity versus you taking that. So I want to make sure people are aware of that. You should be talking to an advisor or whoever, wherever your IRA is about, about the benefits of that or to your tax person. I mean, I've seen, it, I've seen it save people somewhere. I mean, again, it's going to vary maybe considerably on your situation, but I've seen it uh, save people $1,000, $1,500 in taxes by just making that simple adjustment. And it, it doesn't, if you're giving the money away anyway, it doesn't really make any difference in, in your cash flow. In fact, obviously the tax savings is, is a benefit to your cash flow. Yeah. That sort of made me think about, I, I, one of the stories that I've heard that, that I, I still just sort of shake my head at the whole thing. Uh, but there was a gentleman at Zion Mennonite Church who told me, um, one part that made me shake my head was how open he was, but that's fine. Um, told me that he had, he had basically his family farm, and upon his death, the farm would be donated to the Mennonite Foundation, I think. 
The Mennonite Foundation would sell the farm, process that cash, and invest it, and then his children would receive income from that fund for the next 20 years. At the end of the 20 years, the money would go to the church. The church, the money, to, to get the tax savings, your money had to go to an organization. Right. So in 20 years, the church would get money. So the part that I thought was really funny was just imagining being that pastor who's there. Maybe you're at a finance meeting. We just got a check from so-and-so. Nobody even knows who this person was <laughs> 20 years ago. They passed away. But I thought it was, in a way, it's a beautiful opportunity to, I mean, he thought it was almost like highway robbery. He felt like he was stealing from our government, that he could support his family for 20 years and have money go to the church. He felt like it was a complete win-win situation. And, you know, so I think even one of the things that we can do is, hey, if we get to that place where we are at a a later stage in life and we're uncertain about what things are going to look like, uh, we feel like we can't give quite as much. You can always throw the church in your will, too, which to me is, is an incredible gift um, in someone's passing to receive that gift from the church and to think about the ministries that we could do that would grow out of something, something like that. Yes, yeah, so obviously what Hunter's talking about, there's, there's certainly a number of com- more complex um, strategies that you can use in, in, if you have a, a complex estate um, I think the thing that jumped out at me, I th- I, I'm not exactly sure what this gentleman, what all his planning priorities were, but likely one of them was he was trying to save some capital gains tax. And I was thinking something that might be a little bit more practical. Um, you know, some of us might have, um, you know, investment accounts with stocks or mutual funds in that have appreciated. And if you sell those, um, those stocks or those mutual funds, it's going to create a capital gains tax. I don't tend to worry about those things. I don't, I don't have that. <laughs> maybe at some future stage of life. I don't have that stuff. A future stage, maybe when I'm, when I'm older like you. But one of the strategies is you can... <laughs> Thanks, Hunter. Yeah. So one of the strategies is you could donate those, those stocks or those mutual funds, uh, securities, um, to the church or another organization. Uh, you still get the same tax deduction, but it eliminates the, the capital gains tax portion. And uh, just if you're not aware... The, the church does have a brokerage account that you can, can do these transactions through. There's a number of people that use them on a, a more regular basis. Um, and you can have your securities transferred from wherever they're holding, held into the account, get sold, and uh, benefit from that. So if you're interested in that, um, Jack Kess is our current um, finance and, and facilities chair. You can talk to him about how to make that happen. Yeah. And Lionel and I weren't really sure how much of this stuff to get into um, so believe it or not, we're just scratching the surface. Um, there's been a thought, you know, if people feel like they would be good to have a Sunday school class, um, sort of to give us some of these strategies to help us with these, some of these things, come and talk to me. Um, we could run that class so easily here. Lyle is not the only financial advisor here. We have some fabulous financial advisors in this church, um, which I'm afraid to name because I know I'm going to forget somebody and offend someone, but they're there. They're out there. We've got them. Uh, So if you think that that might be helpful, uh, something that you would appreciate participating in, let me know and we'll work at that. But for now, that's probably enough nuts and bolts for me. I've got to come back to the spirituality stuff. (laughs) Um, Let's look at, just real quickly, close things up by looking at the Scripture again. Lyle, could you, for me, you're my reader today, could you read uh, verse 13 through 15 for me, please? Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves... Others will praise God for your obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So I think this reminds me of what I was saying in the children's time, which shouldn't surprise me. When we use our gifts, when we put our gifts to use, people notice. I'm hoping I'm not the only one that noticed when Carolyn was playing the piano this morning. I'm hoping that I'm not the only one that notices when people use their ability to welcome on a Sunday morning or out front shaking hands, encouraging, gifting. There's so many gifts in this congregation, and when we put those gifts to use, others notice. When we put those gifts to use, we draw others into a deeper relationship with God. 
And that's what it's all about. And then it says finally in verse 15, thanks to be to God for this indescribable gift. And as I read it over and over again, it's like I just feel like what, he's thanking God for the gift of giving. Thank you for the indescribable gift of the opportunity to give because that's what he's been talking about. He's been talking about our generosity. And <laughs> we're reminded over and over again that we can't outgive God. Lyle and I are reminded over and over again that Jesus, God, doesn't need our money. I want to say that again. God doesn't need our money. All this stuff we're talking about, it's not because God needs our money. It's because God knows what's good for us. That God calls us into a deeper relationship with Him, and a part of that is giving of the gifts that we have. And in the giving of the gifts that we have, we receive more Jesus. And that's what this series has been all about, and what we will talk more about next week as we focus on the blessing of giving. Um, so I'm going to use that as our ending, and maybe, Lyle, do you want to lead sure. us in prayer again? Yeah. Please? Lord, we, we come to you with, with thanksgiving, just thinking about all the things that you've, you've given us. Help us, help us to consider it, help us to reflect on what it is that you want from us now. What can we give you that we're not giving? What can we give to you that we're holding on to deeply? Lord, we thank you for our relationship with you. Thank you that you care so much for us. Mm -hmm. And we just give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Lyle.